Greetings, everybody. Do you get goosebumps? Do you get excited when you hear the words, the gospel of Jesus Christ? When you hear about the good news of the kingdom of God, the gospel of God, is it something that fills your heart and mind and soul? This is Philip Shields, and if you understood what the gospel really is, you'd be filled with, I call it, outrageous joy every time you think of it. And you would think of it often. I hope today to help elaborate, brethren, on the glorious good news of the gospel of God. It says in the Bible that Jesus came preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. It says in Matthew 4, 23 and other places. He told his disciples, and that includes us, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's at the end of Mark 16. Go to all the world and preach the gospel, the good news to everybody. The result of that preaching, he says in verse 16, could result in believers who would be baptized and be saved, but those who would not believe would be condemned. Brethren, the point is, the disciples were commanded to preach the gospel, and they obeyed that command. Let's take a look at what they preached and how glorious that good news really is. What is the gospel? Why am I talking about it? It was the very first sermon I put on my web, but I feel it's something that has to be put on there again because I dedicate this sermon to those of you who believe the gospel is, uh, or have heard that the gospel is just some message of grace and hope and peace. On the other hand, I also dedicate this to you folks who have been taught over and over that the gospel does not include the story about Jesus Christ or his life and his death and his purpose and his mission because it was the message he brought and not the message about him. You need to hear this as well because the true good news is glorious good news and the true good news is much broader, much bigger, much wider than I think is being preached. When was the gospel first preached? And how does the word gospel impact you? Truthfully, if I say the word gospel, how do you feel? Are you excited beyond belief? Or are you just like most where the word gospel has been so overused and misused and is so commonplace that it's become just another word to you? And that's the warning that I think we have from Scripture is that we don't get jaded, that we don't get hardened, that we don't lose our first love. What is the gospel? When was God's gospel first preached? How does the word gospel impact you? So I must say that if you haven't heard the sermon I gave in the very beginning of 2004, the very first sermon on the website, get on the website, Light on the Rock, and and go to go back to, uh, <clears throat> when you open it up, you'll see that there's a link to the 2004 sermon. Some of my favorite sermons were in 2004. My very first sermon was there on the gospel. I'm going to be expanding on what I gave that day today and uh, also renewing it. So today I think it's time we get excited about some good news. Let's talk about the gospel of God, the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of Christ once more. You know, I prayed and prayed about this sermon because uh, God's people have lost much of their excitement. God's people seem to be in various camps right now, following this man or that man and each group claiming to be preaching the true gospel, but each one preaching a different gospel than the other. Their gospels are not the same. They can't all be true. I'm not attacking anybody here, anybody. I'm not talking attacking any group here. I just want to make sure that we get excited about what the gospel really is. And there are people that seem to be following a man and following a teaching without going straight into the word of God's word and seeing for themselves what God's word really does say. So today we'll review the full meaning of the good news, the gospel, and we'll set the stage, we'll set the stage for the next sermon about how that good news, in fact, was preached from the very first pages of the Bible, way back in the Garden of Eden, all the way to the end. I think clarification is needed on what the good news is, and uh, what they actually preached, what the disciples preached, what Jesus preached, what Paul clearly defines as the good news that he was preaching, and many of you are going to be surprised you'll see that the good news is not so limited and narrow as some make it. I'd like to ask you as well that you take the time, so you'll understand why I'm giving this, to go back to what your church teaches the gospel is. Look at their statement of beliefs, and look at what they say the gospel is, and compare that to what you're going to hear today. A lot of people believe in Christ, 
but they don't believe that the gospel of the kingdom of God had anything to do with Christ himself per se, or very little. And I think that that is something I hope to wake up a lot of people on today, that that's just not what the Bible says. God's house, brethren, is a place where we come and worship God. It's a place where the gospel should be elevated to great heights and preached with great joy instead of so much of what we seem to hear instead. I mean, you should not be going to sleep in services. This should be such great news that you're, you're, you're excited. David got excited. He was dancing, dancing to the point where he embarrassed his wife because he believed the gospel. He understood the gospel way back then, as you'll see. In Romans 15, verses 4 to 7, Now may the God of patience, I just want to read it to you, Romans 15, 4 to 7, May the God of patience grant you to be like-minded towards one another, that uh, according to Christ Jesus, that you may, now here's why we meet, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore receive one another, accept one another, just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. We're to be there glorifying our great Father when we come together, and we're to preach. It says in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, a lot of people use that verse to prove that Satan is the God of this world, and they miss the other key part of that verse, that says we're to preach the gospel of the glory of Christ. The gospel, the good news of the glory of Jesus Christ. Second Corinthians 4.4 4. Today we'll talk about that glorious good news because that's why what we're commanded to be talking about, to be living for, to be sharing with everybody, to be the hope that keeps us going. It's earth-shaking, mind-boggling, it's thrilling. As you'll see at the end of this in the next sermon, I'll have more, much more to cover than I can cover today. I'm going to give a second sermon, how it was woven all the way from the beginning in the book of Genesis. So what makes it so glorious? How big is the gospel? Okay, let's get started. The Greek word for gospel just means good message or good news. The English word comes from the old Anglo-Saxon word God's spell meaning the story concerning God. Brethren, let's get excited about the good news. I'm going to use the phrase good news more often in this sermon than I use the phrase gospel. So even if I use a verse, uh, I'm quoting a verse that has the word gospel in it, I might be saying good news. So if you wonder why how your Bible says gospel and I'm saying good news, it's because I'm translating the word gospel to what it means. It means good news. So it really sinks in that we're talking about Good news, incredibly exciting news. To get the most of this message, I do suggest, like I said, you go back and see what your church does teach. Some teach that the good news was first preached by Jesus. But the Bible says it was preached much earlier than in the days of Jesus and John the Baptist. In fact, it's woven through Scripture from Genesis onward. In Hebrews 4, I'd like you to turn there if you have your Bibles open. Many of you listen to these while you drive or do dishes or whatever, but, but that's why I sometimes don't take as much time to have you wait because I know that's what some of you are doing. But anyway, Hebrews 4, verses 1 and 2, it says there, Therefore a promise being left to enter into his rest, let us fear lest any of you should seem to come short of it. For also we have the gospel, we've had the gospel preached, we've had the good news preached, as well as them. But the word did not profit them, talking about Israel, the word did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard them. So they had the gospel preached, it says in Hebrews 4 and verse 2. We've had the gospel, and so did they, it says. So those who preach and teach that the gospel didn't begin until Jesus started preaching it, that's simply not true. In Romans 1, I'll continue with a couple other verses that show very clearly that the gospel goes to the beginning. Romans 1, verses 1 to 3. Romans 1, verses 1 to 3. Here it says, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, the good news of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning 
I want you to hear what the gospel of God in Romans 1 verse 3, what God says through inspiration, what Paul says inspired by God, what Paul says the gospel of God is all about, which he promised before through his prophets. Here it is right here concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh. But the point I want to stress right now is not what the gospel is, but when the gospel was first preached that it was promised before through his prophets. Now in Galatians 3 and verse 8, in Galatians 3 and verse 8, it says there, And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the nations through faith, preached the gospel before to Abraham, saying, In you shall all nations be blessed. So you see the prophets preached it and had it, Israel had it, Abraham had it, and you're going to see in my next sermon that it was preached from the, in the very Garden of Eden. So I hope this is clear, that the good news was available from the very beginning, and not it did not just start with the preaching of Jesus Christ. So um, what the gospel includes is an interesting thing to look at. What the gospel includes, brethren, is, is awesome. Um, there are many who uh, are teaching that the gospel is only about Jesus. There are many who are teaching that the gospel is only about the kingdom of God. I think the gospel is so much broader than that, so much broader. And in my first sermon that I gave in 2004, if you would take the time to go back and listen to that, you'll have some overlap with this sermon. But I, there I really, really strongly uh, show how it's so much bigger than even what I'll be showing here today. Today's a little different emphasis than what I did in 2004. Anyway, the, the most number of times that the gospel of is used in the Bible is 11 times where it's the gospel of Christ or the good news of Jesus Christ. Also, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is used once. And I have all the verses in the transcript. And if you add to that the gospel or the good news of the glory of Christ in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, we have a total of, then there's also one that's the gospel of his son, the good news of God's son. So it's a total of 14 references that uses the phrase in, in, in a slight variation, 11 of them exactly the same, the gospel of Christ or the gospel of his son the gospel of Jesus Christ, and so on. Fourteen references. That's the most common uh, definition of gospel or, or elaboration on the word gospel, the gospel of. Fourteen times talking about the gospel of Christ, the good news of Christ, the good news of our Lord, the good news of our glorious salvation, the good news of the glory of His Son, or the gospel of His Son. <clears throat> the second most common uh, phrase for the gospel of is the gospel of God. and Or you can say, or the gospel of the blessed God. The good news of God. Eight times. Eight times that is used. Eight times. The second most common. The third most common, and it's used four times. The other one, remember, is 14 and then eight. And now this one is used four times. The gospel of the kingdom. And yet there are people out there who want to profess that the gospel of the kingdom is the only gospel there is. And I, I say the gospel of the kingdom is much broader than you think it is. But it is the awesome news of the kingdom of God. Now let's look at other phrases for the gospel of. In Acts 20 and Galatians 1 verse 6, in Acts 20 verse 24, it says the gospel of the grace, the good news of the grace of God. The good news of God's grace God's grace is good news, brethren, and it must be a focal point. That's not a different gospel. The gospel of grace is not a different gospel than the gospel of the kingdom, nor is it a different gospel than the gospel of Christ. There's only one true gospel. But Paul is just, you know, and others are, are, are just simply uh, describing it in different ways. That's all. It's not a different gospel. The gospel of the grace of God is the gospel. And there are many more. In Ephesians 1.13, it mentions the good news of your salvation. The gospel of your salvation. 
Do you ever refer to the gospel that way? The gospel, the good news that we can be saved. Brethren, the good news is ultimately about the good news of how God is bringing people into his kingdom, <clears throat> to the kingdom of God. Through his grace, that's the gospel of grace, and through the salvation, that's the gospel of your salvation, in and through Jesus Christ, that's the gospel of Christ. The good news message has to include the message of how each one of us can be saved. Being saved from the penalty of sins, eternal death to eternal life, that's got to be incredibly good news if you would just take time to really understand it, brethren. Part of that good news is how God is preparing a bride for his son. The whole universe, in fact, I believe, was created to be inherited by Jesus and his, and his bride. The gospel is about God's family growing large into a kingdom that will fill the whole earth and eventually the whole universe. It's about how Jesus, because of his kingdom there shall be no end. It's about how God the Father is preparing a bride for his son. It's about how God the Father is bringing children into his family. It's about how God in that family of God, how Jesus in the family of God will restore all things to the glory of God the Father. Part of the glorious gospel, another phrase is the gospel or the good news of peace. Ephesians 6.15, I hope I'm making the point the Bible makes that the good news is not just the good news of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the good news is not just the good news of the kingdom of God. It is not just this or just that. It's all of what the Bible says here and there a little, putting it all together, and you have a wonderful, wonderful good news. It is about God's kingdom, and it is about Jesus. It's about him, not just the message he brought, as some are saying. And it's about him who makes the God's kingdom possible. And it's about salvation. It's about grace. It's about peace. And it's about God, and it's from God, and it's his good news. In John 1, verses 6 to 17, and talking about Jesus, the Word, who was God and is God and was with God, not just toward God. He was with God, brethren. He was with God from the very beginning. That's what it says in God's Word. He was the one there with God who was saying the words, let there be light. And John goes on to say, and there are people out there who are beginning to say that Jesus is not God. There are people out there who are saying there's only one individual God, and that's what we would know as God the Father, that Jesus is somehow an inferior being or not fully God. Variations thereof. Brethren, you better wake up to the heresies that are getting out there that are putting Jesus down, that are denying Christ. I think some people are denying Jesus Christ by their very definition of the gospel. In John 1, verse 6, it says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. And this man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all through him the light is Christ, might believe. He was not, John was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. And that was the true light, which gives light to every man who comes into the world. The true light is Jesus Christ, who was there from the beginning with God, who was God and is God, and was there and created all things. By his mighty power as God, fully God. I'm going to give a sermon sometime about how Jesus is God and fully God. <clears throat> he was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. Isn't that amazing? He made it and the people don't made us and we don't know him. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. And don't be down on the Jews because if he came to your hometown, you probably wouldn't receive him either. Or your town wouldn't. Because they're blinded. And their time to understand is not yet. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. This is good news. The gospel of John, the gospel of God through John, he's saying right from the very beginning is about Jesus, who was God, who came to, down to earth as flesh. He begins his story about Jesus saying that he gave them the right to become children of God. That's what the kingdom of God is. A kingdom is a family that's grown large. 
to those who believe in His name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, not just because some man or woman decided to have a baby, nor of the will of man, but of God. You are here because God wanted you here. And you are being called because God wants you in His family. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This man was he whom I said, He comes after me, is preferred before me, because he was before me. And I heard a minister say that before Jesus was born of Mary, he did not exist. Brethren, shame on that man, and shame on any people who are going to be hoodwinked by such a callous lie. John the Baptist makes it clear even here. He, he was before me. And yet John was six months older than Jesus. But Jesus was before me. and Because he was God from the very beginning. And of his fullness we have all received and grace for grace. Grace for grace. For the law was given. I'm still reading John 1 verse 17. For the law was given through Moses. But grace... And truth came through Jesus Christ. So John begins his gospel account of the life of Jesus talking about Jesus' purpose. John ends his book with the very same theme. And if you go to the end of the book of John, you'll, in John 20, verse 30 and 31, he says this was the purpose that he had when he started writing the gospel message, uh, the, his gospel account. In John 20, verse 30 and 31, we call it the gospel of John, that truly Jesus did many other things in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe. He said, the whole reason that I wrote this book is that so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. He's the anointed one. He's the one we're looking for. The Son of God. And that believing you may have life in his name. This is good news. God so loved the world, Jesus told Nicodemus, that he sent me, Jesus Christ, he said, that all who would believe on me might be saved. He sent his only begotten son, that the world might believe in him. And those who do believe in his name, John says at the end of his gospel account, have life in his name. Have life in his name. That's what John says was the purpose of his preaching, the written word, the account about, about, I want you to hear that, about the life and sayings of Jesus, the anointed, that we might have life in his name. If we go to the very beginning of the book of Mark, we'll see what Mark says. Again, the story of Jesus. Not just his words, but his life and his person and his being. Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning of the gospel, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Here's the beginning of my story about the good news of Jesus Christ. And then Mark gets right into the story of Jesus' ministry, his life and deeds. He begins that story by his pointed statement, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And some are teaching that the true gospel is not about, should not include, the life and purpose of Jesus. And I can't disagree more. That is so wrong, and I'll prove as we go along. Even when the angels announced that Jesus' birth, that Jesus had been born, when he announced that to the poor shepherds, what did they say? What did the angels say he came to announce? In Luke 10, Verses 10 to 14. Luke 2, I mean. Luke 2, verses 10 to 14. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I come and I, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Good tidings, good news, gospel of great joy. Outrageous joy. Glorious good news, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ, who is the anointed, the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You'll find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloth, lying in a manger. 
And suddenly there was with him an angel, a multitude, with the angel, a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Whether they spoke it or sang it or chanted it, I don't know. But it is what I'm saying here is that this was called good tidings of great joy. Luke 2 verse 10. The gospel accounts, especially of Matthew and Luke, are full of the details of Jesus' life and even his early life, <coughs> because, brethren, we need to know it in order to have a complete gospel, in order to fully appreciate who Jesus is and was. In preaching the gospel now, let's look at what they did preach. Jesus' preaching is summarized in Matthew and Mark by describing it in Matthew 4.23 and Mark 1.14 and other places, four total places, Jesus' preaching is summarized by describing it as, quote, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. He also sent out his disciples to preach the kingdom of God. It says in Luke 9, verse 2, Luke 9, verse 2, Jesus said he had been sent to preach the kingdom of God, Luke 4, 43. Jesus also prophesied that the gospel of the kingdom would be preached to all the nations as a witness, and then the end would come. Matthew twenty four fourteen. We better get that gospel right, then, if it's going to be a, a, a precursor to the kingdom of God coming, and the end coming. I've read various booklets that make the claim, however, because of the verses I've just cited, that the gospel is only about the coming kingdom of God. The good news, they say, is that this world's, this world's uh, ways are going to end soon. We're going to have the kingdom of God established on the earth. Well, that is good news, brethren, but even though it's established on the earth in millennium, that's not the kingdom of God. That's the kingdom of God ruling on the earth and restoring things on the earth. But we'll get to that in a minute. The millennium is not the kingdom, brethren. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. The millennium is a time of flesh and blood still. But anyway, what I'm saying is they say those verses I just cited above prove Jesus didn't come talking about himself, but about his Father and the coming kingdom of God. They say, the ones I'm referring to, and some of you belong to those churches with this particular doctrine, that Jesus did not come talking about himself. He came preaching the kingdom of God. And he told his disciples to go preach the kingdom of God, not about me, but about the kingdom is what people are saying this all meant. Well, is the good news only about God's coming kingdom? Is it not also about the king, the king of that kingdom? Is the good news, brethren, not also about how you and I can be part of that kingdom? How is the kingdom of God looking at it just maybe carnally and selfishly true? But how is it good news to me? How is it good news to some man rotting in some jail cell who's sorry for what he did that got him there? How is it good news to people who are suffering in various parts of the world? How is it good news to people who aren't physically suffering but don't know God? How is it good news for me if I'm excluded somehow or not told how I can be a part of God's family? How I can get in on this good news stuff. How is it good news for me unless I'm told how I can be part of the bride of the Son of God? Or how I can live and have a home in the heavenly Jerusalem, which will now someday come back down to earth here. When we realize that the gospel and the good news is about the kingdom of God and is also described as the good news of Christ, described as the good news of our salvation, the good news of grace, the gospel of God, and so on, we should take pause. The underlying theme of the Bible is the kingdom of God. God is supreme sovereign over the whole universe, and he's always been supreme sovereign. And he has a kingdom into which we may enter if we've been invited and called, and if we respond and become part of his chosen ones, the ones who are part of the first fruits being called right now, he's not calling everybody yet. But when their turn comes, it'll be good news for them too. The Bible begins with the story of God in the Garden of Eden, which was a type, only a type, of the kingdom of God on earth. 
with mankind communing freely with God. It wasn't the kingdom because it was flesh and blood. Adam and Eve were flesh and blood. The kingdom of God is not flesh and blood, we, we read in 1 Corinthians 15. So I say it was only a type. But early on we read how man had to be evicted from God's presence. Satan became God of this world. And much of this has now got to be restored. All of it's got to be restored. So the Bible ends with God having restored his kingdom on earth. You go to the end of the book, the kingdom of God is being restored on earth. And in the opening chapter, sin enters the world. And in the last chapters of the Bible, sin is forever eliminated. And in between is the story of the good news of our salvation. And being saved is what makes it good news. My being saved is what makes it good news for me. And your being saved is what makes it good news for you. God has a plan for me. That's good news for me. And God has a plan for you. And that's good news for you. About how he's going to bring us into his kingdom. The kingdom itself is not the good news for you or me unless there's a plan that shows how you and I can be a part of it. And that plan heavily centers on the kingdom's king, Jesus. Ultimately, the ultimate ruler and king of that kingdom is God the Father. It's his kingdom. But it's also the kingdom of Jesus as well as I'll show you. But it centers, that plan of how you and I are going to be part of that, centers on what that king Jesus did so we can be a part of it. It has to include that, how I can be a part of it, or else how is it good news for me? The good news gospel of God. The gospel of God, the good news of God. That phrase is used eight times. We have such an awesome Father in heaven after all who loves you and me so dearly and he sent his only Son that we might be forgiven and have everlasting life through him. Indeed, Jesus came to reveal God as our Father in the good news. But Father has a dream, brethren. Father has a dream. This is the good news. You might think your life is hopeless, but Father has a dream. For you and for me. A dream that's going to blow your, not your socks off. He has a dream that's going to make you have goosebumps for eternity when you begin to see it. He has a dream for you to be part of an awesome family that's going to include inheriting everything he has. That's why Galatians says you have now become an heir of God. And we don't get excited about it we got to be excited about it. The good news is about God the Father's dream for you and for me. His hopes and his dreams for you and me. And how he's going to bring those dreams to fruition for his family. What a great God we have. What a great God we have. He came to show, Jesus came to show a way to the relationship with his Father. He taught us to pray to God our Father, to pray for his kingdom to come. He often said, especially in the book of John, that his father was greater than he, that he was sent to do the will of his father, that he spoke the words of his father, that he could do nothing without his father, and that his father would send the comforter, and so on and on about the father. But he also, as he talked about the father, he talked about how the father and I are one, and that his way is my way, and his words are my way, and my words, and I am the truth, the way, and the life. I am the vine, and I am the door, and I am the shepherd. Jesus said about himself. He talked about the way of the Father, that if we love one another, forgive those who have hurt us, if we bless those who curse us, if we act like God when God is in us by His Spirit, when we start looking like God because we're being born again, it's like your children look like you if we start walking like God, just like your children walk like you, if we do good to those who hate us like God does, He sends the rain and the sunshine even on those who curse His name, that we show by these actions whose family we belong to, and that family is God and He is our Father. All of that has to be included in the summary of preaching the kingdom of God. All of that, brethren. In fact, perhaps more precisely, all of what I've said just fits into the gospel, the good news of God, which is used at least eight times. But is it correct to say that Jesus didn't preach about himself? 
Brethren, there are several booklets going out there from several churches to their members and to the world that say that, and that is so wrong. To say that Jesus did not preach about himself or his mission and purpose. Some booklets about the so-called true gospel make that claim. And remember that whatever Jesus is preaching is summarized by the phrase, preaching the kingdom of God. Because whatever Jesus is saying as he opens his mouth when he's preaching is part, therefore, of, I want you to get this, when the summary says that he came preaching the kingdom of God, then you look at the words he said, the words he said have to be included in the writer's mind that all of that is part of preaching the kingdom of God. And Jesus also preached about himself, as you'll see quite often. It's important to realize he did preach the kingdom and about the Father, but he also, also frequently spoke about himself, as you can easily see, especially if you get out a red letter Bible. Pick up a Bible right now with me, if you don't mind, that prints all the, especially the ones that print Jesus' words in red. Skim through the four, four Gospels for yourself after the sermon and see what Jesus is quoted as actually saying as he preached. Keep in mind everything he said is, is summarized by a description of preaching the kingdom of God. This is very important. Some of you are going to churches that teach. Jesus did not preach about himself. The disciples did not preach about Jesus. They didn't preach Christ. They preached the kingdom of God. And you're going to see, brethren, that is so wrong. Did Jesus not preach that we must confess him before men? That we must follow him? That we must not be ashamed of him? That we must come to him if we're heavily laden and so on? If we pick up the Gospel of John, for example, we find Jesus often speaking about himself, and rightly so, because he's the door, he's the way, he's the truth and the life, and he's the resurrection, and he's our salvation, and he's the lion, and he's the lamb, and he's the king and the prophet, and he's the apostle of our high calling. He's our savior and our redeemer. He's our beloved. How can I, the bride of Christ, not Preach my husband to be. How can I, the bride of Christ, and you, the bride of Christ, even possibly believe that we are not, as we talk about good news, going to talk about our beloved? There are people saying that, and it's wrong. He is the way into this great kingdom of God. We must preach him as the disciples did, as Jesus did. John 1 is all about Jesus and how he came to earth and that grace is by him. John chapter 2, he turns the water into wine, a picture of his own blood, shed for many, six water pots of water, six the number of men, and he used the water pots that were used for purification. He had his mission in mind in his very first miracle at Cana. And then he cleanses the temple and prophesies of his resurrection after three days. Is that not preaching himself? In John three thirteen to 21, Jesus speaks of believing in him, having eternal life if you believe in him and accept him. Is that not preaching about himself? As well as of the Father who sent him? In John 4 at the well with a Samaritan woman, Jesus talks about how he is living water. He has living water. He is living water. That if a man would drink of this, he would never thirst again. And he tells her that I, Jesus, am the promised Messiah. Is that not preaching himself? John 5, what I'm saying is, yes, it's summarized that he came preaching the kingdom. But now look at what he said. And you'll see that the claim that he did not preach about himself is simply blinded. In John 5 verses 19 to 41, Jesus glorifies Father. He also definitely speaks a lot about himself in saying how the Father has granted Jesus to be judge of the world, to be the resurrection and the life. Jesus ends in verse 46 to 47 that if they believed Moses, they would have believed in him for Moses wrote of me, he said. Moses wrote of me. Is that not preaching about himself? How can anyone say Jesus did not preach about himself? And some of you are don't even realize your church says that. 
There are thousands who are being taught that the true gospel is not about Jesus. And they teach that Jesus did not come preaching about himself, but just about the kingdom of God. These same people will claim they believe in Jesus, but they don't like to talk much about him in terms of their official definition of the gospel, at least. In John 6, just before the Passover, verse 4 says it was just before the Passover, is all about him being the bread from heaven, that if we eat of him, we will have everlasting life. John 7, he explains that he speaks what his father wants him to speak, but it's also obvious the father wanted Jesus to tell people about his mission and purpose as well. In John 8, after forgiving the woman caught in the very act of adultery, he says to her, I am to the people around her, I am, I am, I am the light of the world. Like John said in John 1, I am the light of the world. Is that not preaching about himself? And after verse 12, it says this. I want you to read this real carefully. John 8, John 8, verses 13 to 18. I wish you'd read this in your own Bible. The Pharisees therefore said to him, you're bearing witness of yourself. You're like being your own witness on, about yourself, he says, they say to him. <clears throat> they heard him say, I, I am the light of the world. And you're talking about yourself, the Pharisees said. Your witness isn't true. <coughs> John 8, verse 14, Jesus answered and said to them, Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. Even He didn't deny that he was bearing witness of himself. John 8, 14, Even though I do it, even if I do it, so what? My witness is true. And then look at all the eyes that come here. For I know where I've come from and where I am going, and you don't know where I come from and where I'm going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one, and yet I do judge. My judgment is true, for I am not alone. I am with my Father who sent me. It's also written in your law. Uh, the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness. John 8, 18. For those of you who still think that Jesus did not come preaching about himself, John 8, 18. I am one who bears witness of myself. And the Father who sent me bears witness of me. It doesn't get any clearer than that. But keep on going. In John 9, he goes on to say how if God were your father, we'd love Jesus. In John 9, he says uh, he says clearly uh, early on that he came to do the works of his father and magnify the father. And, and then he goes on and heals the blind. He shows that Jesus came to, be, uh, to give spiritual eyesight. And then in verse 35 of John 9, he asked the blind man if he believed Jesus, if he, Jesus, was the Son of God. And on and on. John 10, I'm the good shepherd. We enter through uh, the fold through him, the door. John 11, uh, he resurrects Lazarus, showing that he is the resurrection. And he tells Martha, and he tells Martha, I am the resurrection and the life, verse 25 and 26 of John 11. John 11, verse 25 and 26. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. He's preaching the kingdom of God. And he's preaching about himself as well. Because the, to hear about any kingdom, you have to hear about the king of the kingdom. To hear about any kingdom, you have to hear about how the kingdom came about, how, how it came to be, how it came to grow. And all of that centers on what Jesus is and does, who he is. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? He asked Martha in John 11, 25 and 26. And he asked you and me that. Do you believe this? That if you believe in me, you shall never die. You won't die eternally. And he asked you, do you believe this? Or does your gospel that your church teaches claim it's not about Jesus? Well, continue and on your own. You'll find out how Jesus in John 13, 14, 15, 16 goes on talking in 17 about being the way and the truth, about being the vine in the Father's vineyard. And we are the branches. And he, he says so many things. I, in me you have peace, and my peace I give you. And I pray that you all be one as Father and I are one. So you get the point, I hope. So anyway, I hope you will continue on your own. I hope you'll continue on your own.
to go through the book of John and Mark, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, for that matter, and just see for yourselves that Jesus indeed preached so often about himself. Like I said in John 11, there where we ended up. He's the resurrection and the life. I'm reviewing a little bit because the tape recorder just flipped over and I missed some of it, I'm sure. And he says to Martha in John 11, 25 to 26, I am the resurrection and the life, and he who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And he asks us if we believe that he's the resurrection and the life as well. So if any of you still feel the good news is not at all about Jesus or his life, go hear my other sermon. If some of you who belong to these churches that teach us wonder why on earth I'm bothering with this, I'm singing and preaching to the choir, you think, you need to know what your church teaches. There's church after church after church out there that's teaching that the gospel is only about the coming kingdom and not about Jesus. And I'm saying baloney. It is about the coming kingdom. And it has to be about the way into that kingdom or there's no good news. And the way into that kingdom is Christ. I urge you to just use your concordance now and your Bible and look up the scores and scores of verses that mention the word gospel. And then you decide what the Bible actually says about it. It seems to me like people just use the verses they want to use to make their point, And then they ignore the many, many verses. For example, uh, they'll use the verse that talks of verses that talk about how the disciples preach the kingdom of God. And they do not use the verse after verse after verse that says they came preaching Christ. Or they preach Jesus. In fact, I'd like to ask you on your own to look up in a concordance the words preach, preached, and preaching. Please do that. And see what Jesus, see what the disciples, see what Paul preached. I'll give you an example of one right now. Acts 9 verse 20. In Acts 9, Paul had just been converted. He had been Saul. Name, he also used the other name, Paul. He had just been converted. And after the light, after he, he his eyes were restored, and he got his health and strength back, in Acts 9, verse 20, immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. First thing Paul preached, and he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God when he did that. But the first thing specifically he preached about the kingdom was Christ, that he was and is the Son of God. I see booklets, turn now to Acts 8 verse 12, I see booklets that use this verse, and I can't believe it, where Philip is said in the booklet to be preaching the kingdom of God. And they leave out, they leave off the complete verse that actually says, and I think it's intellectually dishonest, the complete verse that actually says, but when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God, <clears throat> that's all they quote in the booklet, and the name of Jesus Christ, and the name preaching the name of Jesus Christ and the kingdom. Isn't that amazing? Now if you go to Acts 8, verse 5, the first thing it says about Philip when he went to Samaria preaching, he'd gone there probably because they, the persecution had driven him there. <clears throat> and then Philip went down to the city of Samaria, Acts 8, verse 5, and preached Christ. To them. The booklets I refer to don't use that verse, of course. That's repeated in verses 37 and 38. Out to the Ethiopian eunuch, he preached Christ. My point is that when you study the words preach and preached and preaching from a concordance to see what the apostles actually preached, because they were commanded to preach the kingdom, you'll see many, many places where they preached Christ preach the kingdom, preach the kingdom and Christ, as it says the very last few verses of Acts 28, I believe, the very last few verses where Paul was in his house there, 
preaching the, th- the things concerning the kingdom of God and Jesus Christ. I think it's Acts 28.20, 20, just from memory. But <clears throat> they preached about our common salvation and so on. But let me just use two or three verses to show you this is the case. It is about the kingdom. But any message about any kingdom has to include the message of its rulers and its king, its systems and its laws. It has to, brethren. Or else you don't have much of a message about a kingdom. And how can anything about a kingdom of God be good news unless wretches like you and me can also, by grace, be part of that kingdom. And yes, I am a wretch. And yes, so are you. Welcome to the party. If you think you're not, are you better than the Apostle Paul, who says at the end of Romans 7, O wretched man that I am! Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Jesus called the Laodiceans wretched and blind. And Paul called himself wretched. Job said he abhorred himself. And these are what men of God come to see of themselves when we compare ourselves to the holiness of our holy and holy and holy God. But there's good news and there's awesome good news. Holy God has called me and you to receive his pardon because of what Jesus did to receive his amazing grace. And it is amazing so that we can be, and not just a part of the kingdom, but be married to, as part of the Father's dream for us, and dream for His Son, is to have a body, a bride, prepared to marry His Son. He wants to have a family. He wants to have a bride for His Son. He wants to put on a wedding. And it's good news, because we're not only going to be in the wedding as guests, We can be the bride in the wedding to the very Son of God, King of kings, Lord of lords, our beloved Jesus Christ, married as His full-time assistant and helper and one with Him. There's only one who can cancel the severe penalty of eternal death each of you incurred. And there's only one, and it's only the saving actions of Jesus our Lord sent by God the Father that allows each of us to participate in the good news. That has to be a huge part of any true and glorious gospel. The gospel of the kingdom is not possible without the gospel of the news of the life and purpose of our Lord, of Jesus Christ, or the good news of his grace, as we'll now see in just a minute. Some of you are thinking, well, wait a minute, Philip. What about what Paul said about preaching a different false gospel? They all quote that. Let's go back there and read that because I think it's so misused. Paul warns us in Galatians 1. I want you to read that with your own eyes, with fresh eyes today. About preaching a false or a different gospel. And many booklets refer to this in Galatians 1. However, I don't think they refer to it intellectually honestly. Let's look how Galatians 1 starts off. Let's get the context. In Galatians 1, verses 3 to 5, right off the bat, grace to you. Grace is his topic. And peace. Remember the gospel of grace? Remember the gospel of peace? Grace and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of God our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. He starts his letter to the Galatian churches by saying that's in Turkey nowadays by saying that I start with grace and I talk about Jesus who gave himself for us that's what I'm talking about and then he goes on he's preaching his gospel he's writing about his gospel the true gospel right off the bat and then in Galatians 1 and verse 6 I marvel you're turning so soon from him who called you into the grace of Christ to something different, to a different gospel than the grace of Christ, is what he's actually saying. I marvel you're turning away from him who called you into the grace of Christ, to a different gospel. Somehow people miss what Paul actually says. He says, the different gospel is something different than the grace of Christ. 
That's the context he's talking about. And he says in verse 6 and 7 and 8 and 9, that then he pronounces a curse on those who would pervert the good news of Christ. Let's pick up now in verse 11 and 12. Galatians 1, 11, 12, But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which I preach, which was preached by me, is not according to man, uh, for it was not received from man, nor, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. He was just saying, the gospel I told you about, Jesus told me about himself. So the gospel is still very much on his mind. And Paul talks about being raised up in Judaism. And then in verse 11, he's just, remember we just mentioned the gospel which was preached by me. Now we pick up in Galatians 1 verse 15. Remember he's put a curse on those who would preach something other than the grace of Christ to something of a different gospel than the grace of Christ. That's what he said in Galatians 1 verse 6. And he started his whole letter in Galatians 1 verse 3 and 4. Uh, grace to you. Now verse 15 and 16, But when it was pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Oh, I thought Paul preached the kingdom of God. Well, here it says he preached him, Christ. And yes, he did preach the kingdom of God by preaching Christ, is what I'm saying. But don't exclude the other. Paul makes it clear here in other places that good news cannot exclude Jesus Christ, cannot exclude grace. I even received an email from someone who said there's not a single verse in the Bible which says the gospel is about Jesus crucified. I just couldn't believe someone would say that. Let's read where it says it is about Jesus crucified. It certainly includes the message of Jesus crucified. The good news of the kingdom has to include the, new, the news of Jesus being crucified. Turn now with me to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 6, which so clearly defines what Paul says his gospel was. Don't have someone else say what Paul said his gospel was. Let's have Paul tell you what his gospel was. And if you're hearing this while doing the dishes or driving the car, I wish you'd take the time to pull over or stop, go grab your Bible. I want, to, I want you to see this with your own eyes. This is so important. It's a double curse on those who would preach a wrong gospel, an incomplete gospel. we got to get it right. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 6. And I'm saying it is about the kingdom of God and about Jesus Christ and not just the message of the kingdom, but it's about the message of how we, through Christ, can be in that wonderful, awesome kingdom, brethren. Now, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 6, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you. I'm going to tell you what I preached, which also you received and in which you stand, and by which you're saved, if you hold... <laughs> are you getting it? I'm about to tell you the gospel I preached. If you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Are you getting what he's saying in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 and 2? I'm going to tell you about the gospel that I preached. And then in verse 3, here's what I preached, he says. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, this is the gospel I preach, is what he's saying here. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas and then by the twelve. And there are people who will tell you the gospel is not about Jesus dying, it is not about the resurrection, it is not about Jesus. It's about a coming kingdom. And I say it is about a coming kingdom, but the coming kingdom is impossible unless they have the message of Jesus on the cross, on the stake, the tree, whatever you want to call it. The Bible uses all of them. Paul gloried in the cross, he said. I will declare to you the gospel which I preached to you. 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Verse 3, I declare, for I delivered to you first of all that which I received, that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, that he rose the third day. You can't have a clearer definition of Paul saying, I preached to you the gospel and here's what I preached. That same Paul is the one who puts a double curse on those who would preach a different gospel than the grace of Christ 
Galatians 1, 6, to a something different. Now in verse 12, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12 and 13, now if Christ is preached, oh, I thought it was the kingdom of God. Yes, it is the kingdom of God, but the kingdom is Christ preached as well. Now if Christ is preached that he's been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection? Remember the context of all of that is defining what his gospel was in verse 1. He's still talking about that gospel and he's going to go on to talk about how we're going to be changed and change the spirit beings because the kingdom of God is not flesh. The kingdom of God is not the millennium. The kingdom of God is about the resurrection. When we are born into God's very family, when we're like him, when we're all spirit beings in a real city with real foundations, Heavenly Jerusalem. One more clearly defining scripture what the true gospel of the kingdom of God was and how it included, very much had to include the shepherd, king, savior that we have. Turn with me to Romans 1. I quoted this earlier, but I want to really emphasize it now for those who still want to teach that the gospel is not about Jesus. Romans 1, verses 1 to 6. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Romans 1, 1 to 6. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, separated to God's gospel, the gospel of God, or the good news of God, which he promised to his prophets, concerning, here's what the gospel is concerning, he says, Romans 1, 3, concerning his son Jesus Christ, who was born of the seed of David, declared to be the son of God with power, uh, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection of the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith. You're going to see how the gospel is also about obedience. I don't know if I'm going to have time to get to all that today, but I sure hope so. If not, we'll do it in part two. Okay, so here again, he's telling the story of Jesus Christ, and he's ta calling that story the gospel of God. Brethren, I hope it can't get any clearer than that. If you look now at what Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, what did he preach? And he was preaching the kingdom of God. But in that sermon, he's preaching Jesus crucified, resurrected, and killed by lawless hands. <clears throat> and you killed Christ, he says. But he's resurrected, sitting in glory in the right hand of God. That's Acts 2. You, you see what else they preach in Acts 4. It's all in my transcript here if you want to look at the verses. But if you go down verse by verse, chapter by chapter, to see what Peter and James and John and Paul and Philip and, and all of them preached. Stephen, what did he preach? They not all preach Christ and the kingdom. So the good news is about God's plan of salvation, Ephesians 1.13, through Jesus Christ to bring us into the kingdom of God, to the glory of God the Father. And that good news is all about getting to know God the Father and Jesus Christ. Let's talk a little bit about the kingdom of God right now. <clears throat> the good news it's very much also about Jesus revealing his father. Jesus came to reveal his father. It's about God's plan to have a family. The kingdom is really a family grown large. In Ephesians 5.5, 5, the, the kingdom of God is God's kingdom. You know, the word God, however, has to include Jesus because Jesus is also God. John 1, the first few verses make that very clear. And so the kingdom is referred to in Ephesians 5.5 5 as the kingdom of Christ and of God. The kingdom of Christ and of God. So the kingdom of God is also Jesus' kingdom. And guess what, brethren? And since Jesus is going to be the heir of that kingdom, and we're going to marry Jesus, <clears throat> if I have a house or some land or property, and I give it to my son, and that son of mine gets married or is married, that woman who marries my son also becomes co-heir with my son. That's the good news. We are going to marry Christ, and as, as, as the married bride of the Son of God, we get to inherit and be joint heirs with Christ. Isn't that awesome? When, the, when the, it says in Revelation 11, the seventh angel sounds, 
There were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. And when you combine that with Romans 8, that makes it very clear that we are children of God, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, Romans 8, 17. That's pretty awesome stuff, brethren. That should be stuff that makes you have goosebumps. I mean, you don't worry about ever being an heir of Warren Buffett or an heir of uh, Billy, Bill Gates or somebody. You're an heir of God. Heirs of God, it says. Get excited about it. Wake up. Wake up from your stupor. We're asleep. We're jaded. We're not excited anymore. God's a little ticked off. That we're not excited about this wonderful gift He's offering us. You, men, you men, uh, ministers who preach, quit preaching in such a boring way. Start to wake up the brethren of God. Start to get excited about your topics. Start to research them a little bit and wake up God's people. Since we're being called and groomed to become the wife of the Son of God, we're going to be co-heirs with Him, brethren. We're going to be re and we've been redeemed from all the penalties we incurred because of what He did for us. That's good news. And we're heirs of God now, it says in Galatians 4. Heir of God. Heir of God. We're heirs of someone much more loving, more powerful, more wealthy, more important, more awesome than any human being, any billionaire could be. He owns everything God does. We're heirs of God and Jesus is not ashamed to call us brethren. <clears throat> it says in Hebrews 11, I think it's Hebrews 11, verse 16, that talking about the men and women of faith, God has a headquarters city called Heavenly Mount Zion. Heavenly Jerusalem above. We're being called to inherit a real kingdom, not just an ethereal kingdom. This kingdom has laws and a territory. It has a ruler and subjects. And it has, it has a place. <coughs> and that headquarters of that kingdom is a real city in heaven. In Hebrews 11 verse 16, now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. And we're ambassadors of God, living as lights here on the earth with the light Jesus gives us as he comes into our life. Remember, he's the light of the world. We don't reflect Jesus' life. No, no, no. He comes into our lives and he shines through us. Therefore, we become lights also. And therefore, God is not ashamed. Hebrews 11:16. God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. <clears throat> God's prepared a city for you in heaven. That will be your city. If you're a citizen of it, that's your kingdom. As joint heir with Christ and the kingdom of God, that city will be coming to earth in the millennium after the heavens and the earth have been dissolved and recreated brand new, it says in Revelation 21. I believe the heavenly Jerusalem is being prepared as the residence of the bride of Christ. I heard, I read some very good notes from somebody in the Northwest on that. And I believe it. I think he's right. <clears throat> the heavenly Jerusalem is being prepared as the residence. We're going to rule on the earth. Yes, brethren. We're going to work on the earth. Yes, brethren. But we're going to live from heaven. That's our home. Verse after verse. I'm going to give you a whole sermon on that because there's some awesome thought coming in, in, into play here. Only the bride of Christ will live there. Probably I could be wrong here, but others who are converted during and after the millennium, they'll live in other cities which will be on the earth when the heavenly Jerusalem comes down to earth. But it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Jesus invites us into that kingdom prepared from the foundation of the world. It's our, our citizenship is up there in that kingdom. What awesome news this is. <clears throat> Have you been kind of downtrodden and poor? Have you kind of never had any good luck? Have you never had any good breaks in life? Here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come, a real city, which has real foundations, whose builder and maker is God. I'm, I'm quoting verse after verse in my, as I speak here. No wonder Jesus told his disciples, and that includes me and you, that he was going to his father to prepare a place for us among father's many mansions, which comes from the Greek word for abode. It doesn't just mean office. It means residence. It means abode. That's what the Greek word means. It doesn't just mean a position of authority. It means a real house. It means a real mansion, a real place to live in. And yes, we will be kings with the king of kings. He's king of kings because we're the kings he's going to be king of. Brethren, are you listening? 
Your wildest dreams haven't come close to what the Father and Jesus are preparing for you. Are you listening, brethren? Are you listening? Your mind and your eyes and hearts and thoughts have never conceived or are unable to conceive of what God is preparing for those who love him. Our beloved Jesus the Master says that God is preparing something way beyond our wildest dreams. It says in Ephesians 3.20, exceedingly abundantly above all which we might ask or think. I want to say again, the kingdom of God is not the millennium. The kingdom of God will be ruling the millennium, but the kingdom of God is heavenly Jerusalem and people who are born to spirit beings. We will be establishing the kingdom's rule on earth, but the kingdom of God is not flesh and blood. 1 Corinthians 15.50 says that. Even the emblem of the lion and the lamb, which is used to depict the kingdom, that's baloney. All of that is flesh and blood. The kingdom of God is the spirit family of God ruling the universe. Way, way, way past lions and lambs and flesh and blood. If they want to use the light of the Lamb to show that when Jesus is ruling on earth, it's going to be a time of peace and safety, that's one thing, I guess. One man said to me today, of course, we can look also at the lion and the Lamb and say that the lion is Jesus and the Lamb is Jesus and the child leading them is Jesus. Perhaps so, we could do that. I've never heard anybody else say that, though. The lion and the lamb motif is physical millennium over which the family will rule, but it's not officially, technically, the kingdom of God is what I'm saying. The kingdom of God is when we're born fully into that kingdom and ruling with Christ here on the earth. We'll be just like Jesus in all of his glory. We'll be shining like the sun in all of its strength, it says in Daniel, I think, 12, verse 2 or 3. Brethren, it's just incredible what we have coming ahead of us here. So the kingdom of God starts with God the Father who sent his Son into the world and whoever believes in him might be forgiven, wouldn't perish but be given everlasting life. That's good news. And given the right to be sons of God, that's good news. And have a part in the kingdom, that's good news. So if you are a wretch, and I hope you know this, that you are one, you know that awesome, glorious news that it, th this is what I'm telling you. If you're in jail, if you've done horrible things, if you've been a horrible sinner like I have been, like you have been. If you're hearing this word, you're hearing God's invitation to become a part of his glorious kingdom. As long as you accept Jesus as your savior and heartfelt repentance and follow him and obey him as your leader and master. I'm running out of time. I really want to get into how uh, the good news is also something that must be obeyed. I'll get into that next time. But pass the good news on. Everyone called by God is being invited into this family of God, no matter what they've been, no matter what sins and mistakes they've made. I know, I'm a living witness of what God will do, what God can do and what God is doing with terrible wretches of sinners like me. I'm one of them. I was one of them. But now I'm washed. And now I'm free. And now Jesus accepts me, even if some people may not. And now I'm a new creation in Christ, whether people want to accept that or not. And I'm preparing for the kingdom of God because God has called me and accepted me. And I've accepted him. And I'm preaching him. I'm preaching the kingdom of God. And I'm preaching Jesus Christ. And I'm preaching the good news more completely than I think many are. It's glorious good news of his son. It's the good news of Christ. It's the good news of God. It's the good news of our salvation. It's the good news, the gospel of grace. And it's the good news of the kingdom of God. Like I said in John 1, where Jesus came and it says, He came that he might give a right, for some to have a right to become children of God. Praise God. Praise him, you saints. Lift up your hands. Raise up your voices in worship. Sing aloud. Get excited about the hymns when you sing. Sing to our great God and to our Redeemer. Amen and amen. Boy, I need about ten more minutes. I'm about ready to have the computer turn off here. I better stop right here. Next time we'll finish this topic. I've got to get into some more things about the gospel. The gospel does have some teeth to it. The gospel does say that we're to, we're to obey it. I want to get into that. The gospel is a way of life. 
The gospel, the good news of the way of the Father, is something we have to live. And it's good news that we can live that way with Jesus living his life over again in us. And then we'll get into how the gospel good news was woven through the Old Testament. You're going to see the gospel, you're going to see the new, the Old Testament in ways you perhaps haven't seen before. You're going to love it because there's so much good news. There are so many types and antitypes that pictured the bride of Christ, that pictured the marriage of the Lamb, that pictured the rulership of God on earth. Oh, brethren, we got to get excited about this. Let's get excited, brethren, and let's pray thy kingdom come, and let's thank Jesus, our Lord, our Master, and our Savior. So yes, for those who believe, the good news is God is sending Jesus to end all the world's troubles, to restore God's way of life. He will rule and set up his kingdom. But the good news is also that you and I are being called to help out with it, and that we have a right and a chance in that because we've accepted him as our Savior, as our life. And he's redeemed us. I'm out of time. We'll continue it next time in showing the good news woven through the Bible. It's awesome, brethren. Great news. It's exciting because God loves you so much. He made a way for you to be part of all that good stuff too. You're going to be part of the kingdom. He has a dream for you. Yes, for you. Your name is written in this book. Your name. You're not here by chance. You're here by design. You're not being left out. Spread the word. Tell others the good news. Tell others to log on to the site and hear some good truth from God's word. Until next time, this is your brother, Philip Shields, saying goodbye, my dear brothers and sisters.